So this kind of has caused me a lot of stress. Uh, because you, you should never do this, but occasionally when someone writes a news article about us, I go read it. And then if I'm really stupid, I'll read some of the comments. So, so usually they're good, like, oh, this is great, I'm excited. But sometimes people, you know, you're, you're stupid, you're an idiot. And someone wrote one that actually hit pretty close to home, which is, you know, it's great you're doing this, but it doesn't matter. Because you know what? That Dell computer that came in styrofoam is now coming in mushrooms. But the whole computer is still really bad for the environment. And this really stressed me out. And you know, it kind of led to this, this, this thought of you can't make a compostable iPhone. And I thought, geez, you know, how would we do this with mushrooms? And I, I went back and sat at my desk and I, I, I was, you know, you can't. You really, I, I was really disappointed. I'm like, you know, I don't see how we can do this. But I said, wait, why don't we just do a feasibility test? Because you know what, I'm, I would like to demand that our electronics in 20 years will be compostable. Just like a chicken, which does something that's more amazing than your iPhone. And I said, well, if I just look around throughout the ecology, can I find examples of all the functionality of an iPhone or a computer? Is, is it, has nature actually already invented all the products and processes we need to make a compostable iPhone? And I, I kind of went through them. And, and as I did this, I realized, you know what, this is actually a lot easier than I thought. You know, these are some of the key components of an iPhone, right, of an electronic device. You've got a microphone. Well, this guy has, like, really cute microphones. You've got processors. We all know what that is. You know, touch sensors. Everyone always talks about the iPhone as one of the greatest touch sense screens on the planet. But you know what? Touch your hand. Come on, put your hands up. This is audience participation's good. All right, feel that. You're you're not just you're not just getting pressure. You're getting heat. You're getting other senses. So the cells in your hand are actually far better than the capacitive touch screen on an iPhone. Speakers. I really I really like putting cute animals on slides. Of course, cameras. Right. This one's easy. But then, then I got to the display, and I realized I couldn't think of a, a, an analog to a display in nature, right? You've got, okay, the peacock's tail, people talk about that, but it's a relatively low, low frequency display. Every, you know, have to grow a new peacock every time you want to refresh. That doesn't work. Um, but then I realized that, you know what, in these situations, you really need to dig deep. So I dug way deep down into the ocean, and I realized that the cuttlefish came to my rescue. Because the cuttlefish is actually has a phenomenal property. This, this, the skin you're seeing here is actually replicating the pattern on the ground beneath a cuttlefish. And they've done experiments in labs where they'll put a cuttlefish over a checkerboard pattern, and the cuttlefish will instantaneously assume the checkerboard pattern on its back. So cuttlefish actually have high-resolution, multicolor displays on their back. So I'm not suggesting we mash all these animals together and make a strange, squishy iPhone for your pocket. But what I would argue is that actually nature has already proven that if we want to, we can make a compostable iPhone. There's nothing special about the functionality. I think that's really exciting. And I just want to tie it up by saying this is this kind of thought process of bioadaption. How can we look at this incredible toolkit that nature has made that has, has worked for three or four billion years to keep our planet in, not only in homostasis, but actually in a continuing state of growth, diversity, and informational complexity? and move away from our current industrial paradigm, which mostly focuses on breaking things down, polluting, and actually hurting the environment. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions on, on mushrooms, on cuttlefish, cephalopods, or anything else people want to chat about. Thank you. Um, so, so actually, you raise a really important point, uh, which is there's a, there's a bunch of different ways of, of composting right now. And um, we've actually been going through this with Dell and our pilot, and pilots at, C at Cedar Grove, which is an industrial composting facility. Uh, and the biggest problem we ran into is that the bioplastics that have been created by the plastics industry require these specialized conditions to break down. 180 degrees Fahrenheit, special microbes, big digesters. So if you put them in your garden, they actually won't break down. We created a product that is home compostable that breaks down your garden. The irony is it doesn't actually meet the standards for these industrial digesters. So we've had to fight and work with the standards organizations who say, look, this isn't a compostable product. And I, you know, I, I actually had to fly out to Seattle and, and get in front of the guy and say, this will compost in your garden. And you're telling me it's not a compostable product. And they said, well, 
okay, we'll work with you on this. <laughs> you know, so the, the, how, how, we, how we set the standards to go around compostability is, is, is a total mess right now and really a challenge. And in some ways, we're on a path of creating not truly home compostable products that fit into nature's ecosystem, but products that pollute the recycling system and actually don't serve the primary goal. So that's my spiel on conventional composting. Okay, your friend's now going to ask me a question. <laughs> I also work in San Francisco. Um, and my question for you is really about your feedstock and what are you seeing in terms of the forecast and increase in demand for feedstocks for biofuels and then how that's going to drive up the cost of feedstock? Because I know right now, corn stover, people are starting to charge for corn stover. It's a great question. Um, so our philosophy is to pay for feedstocks. So we actually pay for our, our corn stovers and all our other uh, bio, bio feedstocks. Two reasons. One is we actually want to, we want to pay farmers. Well, they, should, they should make money. Uh, and two is because you're not going to, we're, we're going into a, a world of scarcity. You are not going to have people paying you to take stuff away, I don't think. I just, I just don't believe it. Uh, and so we should be creating systems and models that actually work on a process where you pay for products. Our philosophy is to then find the lowest grade products that are mostly cellulosic, which generally can't be turned into biofuels, generally can't be turned into other materials, and find a way to use them. So while I expect the price of corn stovers will probably rise, we're going to be on the bottom end of that rising chain. And our other philosophy is to have feedstock independence. So our goal is to be actually use almost anything that's cellulosic in nature. So it may be a corn stover, it could be sawdust, it could be... Um, seed husks from, from oat plants. So if one commodity spikes for a reason, we want to be able to switch. This also helps in regionality, so we can grow these materials locally. And honestly, we've done everything from like hair from a barber shop to lobster shells. <laughs> Even though my R&D team hated the lobster shells because the lab smelled for weeks. And uh, we're always looking for new interesting feedstock. So if you, you have one or you think of one that you think is an underutilized resource, um, I'd love to have my lab team try it. All the way in the back there. If I bought a, a thousand Dell computers and I have all this stuff, this packing stuff, uh, will you take it back? Can you remanufacture it? Will you give me the mail, at least the price of getting it to you? Have you worked out a take back system? So we actually can remanufacture our materials pr pretty effectively, um, and we can we have done that. But our once again the the way I look at the especially for packaging is the issue is. Um, around collection, actually. So you have this, all this material is aggregated at a distribution center. It's sent out to a, a bunch of different homes. And then the actual energy and logistics to return it back to our factory is, is substantial. It's more than the embodied energy within the product, typically. So our philosophy has been, look, our product can be disposed wherever you are in the world because it fits into Earth's ecosystem. Now, if you're a special use customer and you're getting a ton of this material and it makes sense to reprocess it on site, we could set that up. But my belief is that that is actually not the best way to handle disposable materials like this. So, go ahead. Well, yeah, I was just in Iquito, Peru, and all over the river is just all this plastic. So, their way of getting rid of their plastic is to throw it in the river. Uh, is that what you're saying? Is that landfill? It'd be if, they, if we use landfill in our community, your product is appropriate for landfill? Well, no. I would actually say the appropriate way to get rid of our product would be to throw it in the river. No, it, w it, would, it would break down over 30 to 90 days and be nutrients for the environment. The, the idea is, if, if a, when the leaves that hang over the river fall in the river, no one's out there pulling them out of the river because it's polluting the river. You're thinking, geez, good, we've got some more nutrition in this system. Now, there's limits to all of that, right? You don't want to dump 1,000 a, a tons of the material in a kiddie pool, right? But the idea is, it, is it's actually not supposed to be a waste product. And we've designed it so it's actually a nutrient for the environment it ends up in. To be fair, some of the stuff will get landfilled. We look at their being three wins in doing this process. One is you use a low-grade feedstock. Two, you use a fraction of the energy to produce it. And three, which I think is the biggest win, but is going to take a lot of cultural change to implement, is it's going to be a nutrient that, to the community that gets it. So it's not an actual additional cost for them to dispose of it. It should help them grow better crops. Um, I have a question. I'm Anna with the City of San Diego and Zero Waste International Alliance. What is the compostability factor of the material? So if you have something that's PLA, eventually will decompose if you have in a shell through the sun exposure or the heat. You have a chair made of your product. What is the quality control that this won't decompose as you use it? 
So just to be clear, this is made entirely from natural materials, right? So it's made out of corn stalks and mushroom roots. So it's as compostable as any other natural material on the planet, which in my opinion is 100%. It's, it's just as compostable as you are. Now, how do we control that? How do we prevent it from composting in the box? Same way we pr you, people who build stick-built homes prevent their houses from composting, right? It doesn't instantaneously dissolve when water touches it. It needs to be placed in a micro environment where there's microorganisms, like a compost pile. And just like you have different types of trees that have, you know, some are very rot resistant, some break down quickly, there's different types of fungi that break down at different rates. So that's sort of how we, we deal with that, uh, that, that question. Rose Mutavos, um, Sustainable Seas Trust, South Africa. Hi there, thanks so much for that. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I wanted to know whether um, your organization would consider licensing what you do for overseas um, activities, for example, 23 centers for impo impoverished communities in South Africa, whether under license you would allow for the training of individuals, local resources, local labor to produce furniture, to produce desks, for education and skills training for these communities? Absolutely. Um, it's definitely one of our objectives. We, we launched this in protective packaging, but it's also a, also a great building material, actually. And I think it, it has real potential to transform places like that. So I'd, I'd love to chat with you afterwards. Can I get your card before I disappear in five minutes? <laughs> Even Steve Davies, NatureWorks, uh, thank you. And want to just second your point about cost effectiveness and cost, you know, is everything. Um, to that point, how do you compare on the finished constructed foam, you know, for a Dell computer, say, on, on versus what a, a sealed air would do? I, now, in a, at a bigger scale, there's an implicit endorsement, obviously, in the partnership you just got with yeah. sealed air. So, <laughs> congratulations there. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So, we're um, on a, we're usually within 10 or 20 percent of the cost of a conventional piece of styrofoam today. Um, Right now, our biggest driver is around labor, so that's our single biggest cost driver. Um, we just brought our big, big plan online uh, like a week ago, and our, we're, we think we're going to be able to beat parity with a conventional polymer. Uh, we won't be because we're actually not a plastic. You know, we're, we're actually making a bulk composite that performs like the product we're replacing. There's some foams, like super low density foams, we are not cost competitive with today. And actually, as the density of the foam, so the more plastic that's being used increases, the more cost competitive we, we get. And it's around a pound and a half, a two pound density that we really hit parity for, for most applications. But that is the, you know, that's the, 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 whole, the whole model is predicated on that, getting to break even. Well, I just wanted to comment on that and congratulations. If you're close to uh, parity with virgin polymers, that means you've got a bright future. It's really difficult to do on a startup, so congratulations, Evan. Thank you, Mike. Cool. Um, if there are any other questions, maybe we'll wrap up, move on.